it's an ambitious production, but shall it pass? Does that work? I don't know if that joke works. You shall not pass! <laughs> Cast your mind back to 2007. This is a year of things, and one of the things that happens in this year is that the Lord of the Rings musical hits the Theatre Royal Jury Lane, one of the biggest West End theatres. This incredibly ambitious production failed to get the audience in and became one of the West End's biggest flops. Since its closure, the Lord of the Rings musical has not seen a single production until now, 2023, where the Lord of the Rings has its first revival in the regional theatre, The Watermill, which is located in Newbury, which, for those of you who don't know, is about an hour and a half away from London. This semi-immersive production has gone in a completely different direction to the first version of The Lord of the Rings. Going from this absolutely giant West End theatre to a very small regional one. Has this big decision paid off? Let's find out. But if you haven't seen my face before, hi, I'm Ellie. I talk about theatre. I do reviews, I do discussions, I do video essays. And if any of that sounds interesting to you, please consider hitting like and subscribe. It really helps me out and helps out the channel. But let us dive into The Lord of the Rings because I have a lot to say about this production. The Lord of the Rings musical is an adaptation of all three books. And if that sounds impossible, you'd be correct. It is trying to do the entire story in three hours. To put that into perspective, the first film, the extended edition of the first film, is longer than this musical. So you can already tell how difficult this is. And you know what? They managed to do it just about. It is impressive, and I think credit needs to be given where it's due. The fact that they've managed to put it into three hours and still managed to make it feel cohesive and it's still able to be followed as a story, I am shocked that it works as well as it does. That being said, even to someone who has a more outside perspective on Lord of the Rings. Like, I've seen bits and pieces of it, I've played the Lego game. <laughs> I know, like, the outline of the story, um, but I don't know any of the finer details. Even to someone like me, it did feel like a lot of the time, a lot of the details were being glossed over. And from speaking to people and do looking into it a little bit more, yes, there is a hell of a lot they cut out. So much so that I do wonder whether Lord of the Rings fans are going to be very upset about the things that are cut. To let you know what the basic structure of this show is, Act 1 is pretty much Fellowship of the Ring. It is the entire like first book and first film, that's Act 1. Act 2 rushes it a little bit and crams uh, the Two Towers and Return of the King into one mainly focusing on the Gollum plot side of it, and cutting a lot from uh, the rest of the Fellowship's journey. I think, on the whole, fantasy is a very hard genre to do on stage, because I often find that a road trip kind of musical doesn't tend to work. The more kind of spaces you're having to go to, places you're having to visit, theatre isn't always the greatest medium to do something like this especially in a smaller theatre space. And because of the constant hopping of places, because of the constant travelling you're having to do, it's often a genre that struggles a little bit. But if there is one thing this musical does incredibly well, it is the design and the production value itself. This version of Lord of the Rings, almost everything from a design perspective, works. And if I didn't think it worked, I could at least see the idea, and I could see a slight way of adjusting it to make it work. There has been so much thought put into every single moment of this production. Take the immersive elements from it. The very start and the very end of the musical take place in the Shire, which they have decided to place into the gardens right by the Watermill Theatre. This is a much bigger space than the actual theatre itself. 
And in this area, you mill around with the hobbits. You're in Bilbo's birthday party. You're playing party games. And it's this wonderful space to be in. And the bigger stage here allows for more intricate dance sequences. And especially when you go back out in Act 2, it is beautiful. When the sun has set and it's dark and they've lit it up with all these lights and you see the trees and the forest and the greens. It is a stunning sight to see. This is definitely one where I would watch it at an evening performance rather than a matinee because you, you wouldn't get that impact of the lighting as you step back outside into the Shire. The pre-show is so much fun. The actors talk with you, welcome you to Bilbo's birthday party, ask you why you're here, how you know Bilbo, invite you up to play party games if you so wish. It's so much fun and you can kind of pick and choose how much you want to interact or stay behind a little bit. Then after the 10 minutes is up, after they've done the introductory bit in the Shire, they shuffle you into the theatre. This is done incredibly well as they stamp at the back of your hand with a colour ring. And that colour ring is the door you need to go in. It's very slick. The way they do it is very impressive with both the cast and a couple of the ushers bringing you into the theatre. This theatre is set with a very simple set. It looks deceptively simple. The back wall is wooden. There is a kind of like, you know in trees when you get like the eye? <laughs> I don't know if this is making sense, but, but you know like th there's like the imperfections in the bark and it looks like an eye? That's what they use on the back wall. <laughs> as well as these two doors with very like elven symbols or like the weave, the weavy symbol. Yeah. <laughs> but they really do bring this set to life with puppetry, projection, a revolve and the lighting to make it feel so varied. Despite being in an incredibly small space, it feels so expansive. With so many tricks being done to really up the scale. There are moments while you watch this that you completely forget that you're in a really small regional theatre. I think there are definitely moments where it does yell out for a bit more space. Especially in the moments where the whole cast is on stage. There's a bar scene towards the start of Act 1 when our travellers uh, visit a pub where they're meaning to meet Gandalf. And this results in a nice little song and dance with everyone there, and you can tell how cramped everyone is on stage. As well as this, a lot of the fight sequences that they do feel like they struggle to really portray the scale of it. You think of the film, you think of these absolutely massive spaces with hundreds and thousands of orcs fighting our heroes. Whereas in the play, you get about three or four. You don't really get that scale that you could get in film. And it almost makes them incomparable. But for every moment that feels like it could use a bigger space, there's the scenes like Gandalf's Last Stand, his famous You Shall Not Pass, where he starts to rise as the monster which is portrayed by this long, black sheep that's kind of rising up and down as Gandalf starts to rise on a lift behind it. It feels so thrilling and so satisfying to watch. It's such a powerful moment. There's also the introduction to the Golden Elves, if that's their name. They're the elves that are gold. They probably have a proper name, but that's what I'm going to call them for now. <laughs> Where we have this giant ring come down that unfolds and makes itself massive on stage. It's beautiful to see. And then there's the puppetry, which throughout the show just keeps getting better and better. We start with the Dark Riders, which are represented with these horse skull puppets. I would have liked to see like a bit of sheer black material attached to it to give them a little bit of that more ghostly feel. But the puppets are so eerie, it really does work, especially when they're coming alongside you. I was placed on the very end of the stall seats, so a lot of the time I had the actors walking past me. And as you have these guys with the puppets going past you, it is creepy. But the greatest puppet in the show, and one that I really don't want to spoil too much, is the way that they do the giant spider. 
They open the back doors and you just see the spider's eyes lit up with these two lights. It is creepy. And then you see it start to come out with all of its legs and it's like, oh my God, as it hangs over the audience in the front rows, it is terrifying. It is so well done. And the lighting helps as well, making it kind of dark so you can't quite make out the full image of this creature, but you know what's there. You can tell exactly what's there and you can tell how horrifying it is. It is such an impactful moment. On the other side, I like what they do with the costumes. The costumes are good. They represent this kind of style quite well, but with it also being quite stripped back. They decided in this production to... I'm going to phrase this in a little bit of a weird way. Cast it invisibly. So the elves don't have pointy ears. The hobbits aren't short. And I guess it works. You know, you know who these characters are. You know what they're representing. It's not the most necessary design detail. There's only one costume that I really felt didn't work. And that were the orcs. I like the idea behind it. Uh, they are presented in very modern black streetwear with a gas mask on their face. Which, yeah, I get what they're going for. And I think the gas mask works. I think that makes them look inhuman. I think that is perfect. The streetwear though, they look less like orcs and more like they're going to start shouting at me outside of McDonald's at 10 p.m. You know, <laughs> I, I don't think it works. And I think it's very clashing with uh, the rest of the very, like, fantasy costumes. Because that's the only one that kind of dies outside of that, I just don't think it works in that regard. If they went for, like, a more, like, armour-type costume, but keep the gas mask, I think it would be a little bit more effective. So from, like, a design perspective and, like, a staging perspective, this show does so much right. I think everything to do with production is so perfect and if it's not perfect it's nearly perfect it just needs a slight tweak a little bit of a bigger stage and then it would work so well i could speak for hours and it feels like i already have just on the production elements of this show it does such a good job at making it feel impactful and powerful while still being very stripped back there's so many great ideas here there's so many things and i feel like giving the show this limit. They give the show the limit by putting it in a smaller theatre. They have to be a little bit more creative and it's really, really paid off. I feel like it's the actual musical that struggles a little bit more. As I've said, the story, it works. It's fine. It does the job. I mean, I don't think there's any other way that you could tell the story of all three books and make it cohesive without making it like this. But I think the thing that made me the most disappointed was the music. I think the music is one of the weaker elements of the show. Now, people going into this are going to expect the music from the film. The music from the film is so iconic. So you need to go in one of two different directions. You need to be completely different or you need to be better. You need to improve on it completely. I'm not sure if the production quite hits either of those. There's a lot of good ideas here, and I think where the music works best is through the atmosphere. It's very atmospheric. I would be hesitant to call this a musical in the same way you would call Les Mis or Waitress or Cabaret or like that style of musical theatre a musical. This is a little bit more akin to Totoro, I guess where there's music baked in. There's definitely music baked in, but it feels like it's there more for the atmosphere of it. It's more of a musical than Totoro. Whereas something like Totoro had uh, one singer at the back, this is done with a cast singing as well. And there are moments where they break into song. But what I will say is that the moments where they break into song, it feels more natural. It feels more diegetic in a way. But on the whole, I just didn't feel like the music was that memorable. The standout of the show for me personally was Now and For Always, which is this really sweet ballady song between Frodo and Sam, which gives you another insight into what they're like. And it's followed up with a slightly twisted version, which is portrayed by Gollum. 
This isn't a score that you'll go away singing, but what I will say is that it is appreciated in the moment. I think a lot of this music works for what it's going for. It's just a shame that it doesn't feel as impactful as the film's score. But within this music, there is the fact that this is an actor muso show. The actors are playing the instruments and they all double up. This is mainly being done because of the theatre it's in. There's no space for a band here. And there's probably, with how much they're spending on everything else, there's probably not the money for a band here. In this trend, there is a certain fear that I have, because I love this trend, but I love this trend when it's done right. Amelie, which is another show that actually premiered at this theatre, did it right, where the choices of character to instrument feel purposeful. The way that they embed it in feels purposeful, and here it feels purposeful. It's not being hidden away like some other productions have done. It blends so well into the show that I can't even really picture it without it. I can't really picture the Lord of the Rings musical without Sam and his guitar. And that's the mark of it being done well. Now, I've spoken for years and years about everything else. Let's talk about this cast. I'm going to start with a couple of the actors who I felt were the strongest, and then I'm going to talk about the rest of the cast. Because I felt like there were definitely some absolute standouts, and everyone else did a really good job. Nuon Hugh Pereira as Sam is probably one of my favourite performances of the night. I think he was such a highlight, especially because his relationship with Frodo, it felt so sweet and earnest. And he fits so perfectly into that type of sidekick role. As well as really shining in his vocal performances, now and for always being one of the musical highlights of the night for me. He is absolutely perfect in this role. He is so sincere. You really do attach to him in his character. But then there's Gollum, played by Matthew Bug, and wow, the impact that Gollum has in this show is almost undescribable. It's so hard to put into words exactly why this works so well. I mean, Gollum is only a presence in Act 2, and the fact that he is still one of the highlights of the show is a testament to how they've really handled Gollum well in this version, and is also down to Bug's perfect portrayal. His performance creates such discomfort and unease. The way he's introduced, he starts right at the back of the theatre, hanging on to the ledge, right by uh, the second tier of seats. And then he climbs all the way around, hanging off the ceiling and off the walls, climbing his way to the front and onto stage. When he's walking through the theatre, there was a moment, because of where I was sat, where he was hanging from the ceiling right next to me. His physicality, his vocal performances and how he puts on his Gollum voice, feeling like a very nice tribute to the film version. He is a complete standout in this show. A couple of other highlights for me is Peter Maurinka as Gandalf. I feel like he has that perfect power and presence that lends itself hand in hand to a role like Gandalf. And Louis Mascal as Frodo. He is a great lead. There are so many constant trials that Frodo goes through, and these are heightened by Mascal's performance, which feels very human and troubled. As Frodo really struggles with the task that he's been given. The rest of the cast gets some really strong moments to shine too. Geraint Downing and Amelia Gabriel as Merry and Pip, respectively, are great comic relief. The rest of the Fellowship really get their moments to shine. With Folaren Akinmaid as Gimli, Aaron Sidwell as Aragorn, Yazdan Kofori as Legolas, and Peter Dukes as Boromir all getting their moments to shine, even if the material isn't quite as fleshed out as the film versions. Georgia Louise gets a really strong moment towards the end of Act 1 to really stand out as the leader of the Golden Elves, Galadriel. One of the best moments is when she's starting to be tempted by the ring, and she's lifted up on the lift. It's a very powerful moment. It's a great cast. They really do take to a lot of the challenges of this material, and the challenge of portraying characters who are so beloved. 
There is a lot to say about this version of Lord of the Rings. With putting a couple of more restraints onto themselves through the production, they have created something truly beautiful. There is definitely something to say about the material being a little bit weaker, but I think it is more than made up for with this absolutely phenomenal production. There is certainly so much to love here. And I really hope that this gets the chance to move into a slightly bigger space after its run. I think with a production like this, they could take the chance they could move into a slightly bigger theatre now. It feels like they have really learnt the mistakes from their original production, and they have made the definitive version of Lord of the Rings on stage. This production is extremely impressive. And with a few tweaks, this could be the one show to rule them all. But what do you think? Are you interested in a Lord of the Rings musical? Did you see it in the original West End version? Or have you seen it at the Watermill? Let me know all your thoughts in the comments down below. If you did enjoy this video, please consider hitting like and subscribe. It really helps me, it helps that channel. Here's some links to my other videos on screen right now and a link to my Instagram if you want to drop me a follow over there. But that's it for me today and I hope to see you next time. Bye.